I went in preparation of our time together today. Um, I took it upon myself, you know, now that I don't have two jobs. All right, had some time. But I took it upon myself to uh, do some intensive study and some rigorous training. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to learn everything I needed to know to be a zookeeper and wildlife educator. All right. And so I have, I have got some knowledge that I now want to hand down to you. Okay. I want to give you some stuff. Now, it's really important that I clarify this to you, that everything that I'm about to share with you is not information that I need. Okay. I will never be in a situation where I need to know anything I'm about to share with you. But because I care about you, all right, I want to make sure you guys are equipped with this knowledge. Is that, is that good? Is that helpful? It's all about you. Okay. It's all about you. All right. Now, for the sake of time, what I want to do is I want to give you three tried and true, not tried by me, okay, but tried by, by me, okay, but tried by people who are crazy enough to do this stuff. Tried and true ways to escape life endangering moments. Okay, we'll, we'll call them cheat codes. Everyone say cheat codes. All right. So what I want to do, I'll just give you three. All right. So I'll show you right now how to survive being approached by a shark, and then I want to show you how to, and we're, we'll go through these, but how to to survive being approached by a shark, how to survive being shot with a poisonous arrow, and how to survive being approached and confronted by a bear. All right, you guys ready for this? Cheat code number one. I'm a professional, so listen to me. If you find yourself in the ocean, swimming around and a shark is approaching you, conventional wisdom says that you should swim in the opposite direction as fast as you can, or at least faster than the person next to you, all right? Conventional wisdom says to maybe splash and fight, right? That's what conventional wisdom says, all right? But all that does is confirm and indicate that you are, in fact, prey, all right? Newsflash, you cannot outswim a shark, okay? And so, what you actually need to do is turn and face it. Sharks are ambush predators, and they prefer to attack from below or behind. And so survival is dependent upon your ability to, and, and I'm not lying about this, it's funny, right? But it, it's dependent upon your ability to maintain eye contact and gently redirect the shark by placing your hand on top of its head and locking your elbow, all right? Experts say 99% of the time, I wanna talk to these experts a little bit more, 99% <laughs> of the time, the shark will turn off. So lock your elbow, redirect, and then back away slowly. That 1% sounds really scary to me, but, but there you go. If you're ever in that situation, again, a non-issue for me. Amy knows. I'm, I'm not about that life. Okay. Second, second cheat code. Cheat code number two. If you find yourself getting shot by an arrow, conventional wisdom says to pull it out. But experts, experts say that if you're near a doctor, you actually need to leave the arrow in and bas basically minimize the bleeding. And if the arrow has punctured a, a large vessel or organ, pulling it out can actually cause more damage. But if you're not near a doctor and you have reason to believe that the arrow is poisonous, because if you're going to shoot arrows, <laughs> why wouldn't they be poisonous? If you have reason to believe that the arrow is poisonous and has to be removed from your body, most arrows actually have barbs at the end of them and will cause more damage if you pull out the way they entered. And so if an arrow must be pulled out of your body, this is not a movie, guys. It would be best to push it all the way through the other side to pull it out. God bless you if you're in that situation. <laughs> and God help you. <laughs> Cheat code number three, if you are confronted by a bear, conventional wisdom says to run. But the first thing you need to know about outrunning a bear is that you can't, <laughs> all right? Bears can run 40 miles per hour where the fastest human beings can run in the 20 mile per hour range. All right, you're not outrunning a bear, all right? Now the color actually matters too. There's a bear safety rhyme that can really help and it's this. If it's brown, lay down. If it's black, 
fight back. If it's white, good night. <laughs> if you're ever in a place where there could be a polar bear, that's on you. I just, I just want you to know that. All right. Can't really help you there. All right. But to run away will make them perceive you as prey. So the best practice is, again, to stay calm and face them. Talk to it. I'm serious. Talk to it so it knows you're a human. Right? And if it starts to approach you, make yourself as big as possible, stretching your arms over your head and making loud noises. Good luck. So that concludes my TED Talk tutorial on how to escape life-endangering moments. Um, again, these cheat codes will help you. It can save your life, even though you unnecessarily risked it in the first place. All right, so... Uh, what I learned as I was just looking at that and researching it, <clears throat> and we were, uh, Amanda and Amy and Aaron, as we were talking about it this last week, we got a chuckle. <clears throat> but what, one thing that I learned as I was looking at this is that, you know, conventional wisdom is more often the wrong way to approach moments like these. It's the wrong way. When in danger, survival is all about knowing the right thing to do and doing it, even if your impulses say to do otherwise. All right, so it may be counterintuitive, but it may mean facing it head on and leaning into the danger. All right, that's what I want to talk about today. Now, we're in a, a series that we've been calling Build the Hearth. And, and let me just stop there because, uh, you know, there's been some controversy and some murmuring happening around here, or many of you guys think I'm pronouncing that word incorrectly. All right, so hearth, hearth. Tomato, tomato, aunt, aunt, gif, jif, whatever. Okay. Now I'm realizing this is a stumbling block for some of you guys, so I'm going to try to assimilate. All right, hearth, heart. Everyone say hearth, hearth. All right. But more importantly, more importantly than how that word is pronounced, uh, as we begin this new year, we believe we're in a moment in the life of our church where focusing on our stewardship of the presence of God is vital. And so what we've been doing is we're going to be looking at famous fires in Scripture that tell us something about the character of God. And uh, we will also look at what the fires meant to reveal about us. Amen. So a few weeks ago, I kicked off the series by looking at the life of Elisha and Elijah. And what we learned was the importance of burning our plows and answering the call of God. Do you remember that? Uh, the week after, we went into a weekend of triumphing over trauma and we learned about the soul injury that trauma can create and how it impacts us uh, in our bodies and our emotions and our relationships with each other, also our relationship with God. You guys remember that? Uh, last week, Dr. John was in his Leviticus bag. Right, if you were here last week, my goodness. All right. I mean, he had us in Leviticus and was going off. All right. All right. And he was teaching us about the old and new covenant distinctions for what nearness to God means. And he identified our hearts as the hearth. Got it. Hearth that God is looking for. All right. So today what I want to do is I want to look at the story of the three Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter three. All right. Now, this story is legendary. This is a legendary story. There are many unbelievers, many people who will never step foot in a church, many people who have never read the Bible for themselves that know this story. And maybe you do, too. Maybe you know this story really well. And I want to look at it with fresh eyes today. Is that all right? All right. And so as I uh, spent time uh, with God, just praying for you, thinking about this moment, thinking about our time together, and I was asking him what he wanted us to go after today. I believe he wants me to say this, that we need not fear our furnaces. We need not fear our furnaces. Fiery furnaces are coming. Fiery furnaces are a metaphor for hardship and suffering. Most Every credible religion gives us resources for how to suffer well, and the ones that can't don't actually maintain credibility for long. Because suffering comes to all of us, doesn't it? From the worst things like violent crime, uh, terminal illnesses, to things like grief and depression, all the way to the end of the, of the scale and the simplest miseries of having what you don't want or wanting what you don't have, right? Suffering is real to every human being, right? But for the people of God, and this is where I want to camp at today, for the people of God, for anyone who knows 
talks with Jesus, the cheat code. Everyone say cheat code. The cheat code, the, the counterintuitive way for us to live is to not fear our furnaces. We face them. We lean in to the danger. All right. So the setting of the book of Daniel is about 605 BC when the Babylonians led by Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem and kidnaps a wave of Israelites and brings them back to Babylon as exiles. Now, now among them were four men of David's royal family, Daniel and his three friends whom you probably know by Babylonian names, Shirak, Meshach, and Abednego. The book tells of their struggles to maintain hope in the land of their conquerors, right? And in Daniel chapter three, these three Hebrew boys find themselves in a really bad situation. Uh, and we're gonna look at this together. We're gonna look at the whole chapter. So what I want you to see as we look at this chapter, uh, see their challenge, and then we're gonna look at their response, and then we'll finish with their victory, all right? Their challenge, their response, and their victory, all right? So first, their challenge. Daniel chapter three, starting in verse one. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officers to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. And so the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all of the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you were commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. All right, and so, King Nebuchadnezzar is doing what many rulers and politicians have done all throughout history, and this is still continuing on to today. What he's doing is he's using religion to strengthen his grip on political power. By summoning, by summoning all the highest ranking officials to this event and making them bow down to the statue and worship, he's attempting to blend spiritual allegiance with national allegiance. Right. And, and if that weren't enough, he attaches the accusation of treason to anyone who refuses to do this with an immediate death penalty of being thrown into a fiery furnace. Right. Everyone, including these three boys, uh, were being forced to bend the knee and worship this idol. Now, what we're going to see is that these three boys refuse to participate. And with the size of the crowd assembled, there is no way that Nebuchadnezzar would have been able to know that they weren't bowing, but there were some people who did not necessarily like how they were being promoted and elevated and saw this as an opportunity to narc on them, okay? So starting in verse eight, it says, at this time, some astrologers or Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold and that whoever does not fall in worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace but there are some jews whom you have set up over the affairs of the province of babylon shadrach meshach and abednego who pay no attention to you your majesty they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up now this whole ordeal takes place because of one thing, jealousy. Some of their Chaldean peers didn't like them, and so they couldn't wait for an opportunity to take them down, right? Now, I want to say this, and this is another one of those counterintuitive cheat codes, right? But I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this in other people's lives. I've seen this. This happens all throughout Scripture, and particularly happens in this story, and it's this that if you have haters, if you have enemies, if you have critics 
in your life, instead of seeing them as a problem, you ought to thank God for them. Haters are elevators. Say it with me. Haters are elevators, right? If you have people in your life that are committed to your downfall, it can be the absolute best thing for you. It can be the best thing for you, right? Now, just stay with me on this, okay? Uh, your enemies are going to find your flaws and expose them. Isn't that what they try to do? They try to find your flaws and expose them. Your friends don't even do that. Many have friends that are so consumed with, with staying on our good side that they would never tell you about yourself. But you know who will? Your enemies. Now, sometimes our enemies are exposing legitimate flaws. Sometimes the criticism is warranted, isn't it? And we have to own that, by the way. We have to own that. Man, I hate her. She's always telling my manager that I come in late. Stop coming in late. Man, she didn't have to tell him what I said about him. Stop talking about people. Like, right? So sometimes they are revealing things that are true character flaws, real character flaws. But if you change your perspective on these people, it can change your life, right? Because if you are blameless like these three boys, now if you're not blameless, then there's stuff that you gotta fix. But if you're blameless like these three boys, if the only thing that they can criticize and try to tear down a commitment to a relationship with God, it's game, set, match. And that's what's happening right here. Picking up in verse 13, it says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I've set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. Now, ask yourself honestly, how would you have responded to this moment? They were being asked to bend, man, we got some busy people in here today. <laughs> they were being asked to bend. Nebuchadnezzar confronted them and told them to bow, and if they didn't do it, they would burn. Think about the pressure on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to compromise, right? They had the king, they had the furnace in front of them, they had the subliminal sway of the music, they even had their peers and their enemies, and all of them were trying to get them to compromise. So their challenge was that they were being told to bend, bow, or burn. They had haters who turned them in for not obeying the orders, and they were being pressured by everyone to compromise. Amen. All right, so let's look now at their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, verse 16, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If you are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, I love that, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. All right, now this is, a, this is a bold statement to make to the king, no doubt, but it's important to notice, again, this is why I wanna look at this with fresh eyes, it's important to note that this was not the first furnace that these boys were confronted by. Uh, the, these boys had smaller furnaces that they had to endure before this one. All right, let's count them, let's count them. In Daniel chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar ordered that the boys be renamed. He ordered that they be taught Babylonian culture, the language, and that they be fed his food. And all of it seemed all right to the boys, except the food. Right. Have you ever gone to someone's house, and you could kind of hold up with everything that's going on, but then they put food in front of you, and it's like, I'm out. Like, this is not, I'm not. This never happened to you. Okay. <laughs> move on, move on. They made it up in their minds that they would not defile themselves with the king's food. I mean, to, to, to partake 
uh, and, and a pagan feast to them would be a form of idolatry. It was an issue to them of worship. It was an issue of worship. Right? And so this was a test of integrity. In hard times, your integrity will be tested. All right? Integrity means uprightness and character and action. It's firm adherence uh, to a code of moral values. It implies trustworthiness and incorruptibility. Uh, but, but what's interesting, and I think we need to, to note this, is that it actually wasn't captivity that tested the boy's integrity. You know what it was? It was privilege. See, for some of us, lack is a great test. Not being able to, to have what you want or do what you want is hard on some of us, right? It, it'll reveal what you believe and who you trust. But for others, we can handle lack, right? But what we can't handle is prosperity and excess, Right. That reveals some of our heart trust. Right. And so the king was trying to give them all this stuff to prepare them to enter into his service. And these kidnapped slaves said no. They said no. All right. In their smaller furnace, they chose integrity over compromise. Uh, in Daniel chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him and wanted someone to interpret it. And so he called all of his magicians and his enchanters and sorcerers and astrologers for it to do so. But he wouldn't tell them the dream. Okay, imagine that. Interpret my dream. Okay, sure, what is it? I'm not telling you. You're so bad, I want you to tell me my dream and the interpretation is what he said to all of them. And he said, man, we, we can't do that. We can't. And I love their statement here, what they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, especially as a New Testament believer, right? We believe that God is near, he's present, and he resides in us. This is what they say to him when he re requires them to, to tell the dream and the interpretation. They say this. They say, your demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among people. All right. Be included in this group. And so Daniel, when he found out about this, he said, whoa, 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 give me some time. Give me some time. Let me figure this out. And he got with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in that moment, they could have been filled with self-pity and despair, but you know what they did? They prayed. So how about you? How about you? If getting direction from God right now was a matter of life or death, would you survive? This was a test of intimacy. Hearing from God in this moment was a matter of life or death. See, I, I think some of the issues that we run into and that's plaguing the people of God is that we're so distracted by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust for other things, that we don't have time for a devotional life. I was just thinking about this the other day. It's like, like when I was a kid, all right, and my kids think I was like around when dinosaurs were around, but it wasn't, okay, I'm talking about 1980s, 1990s, okay, the best years on the planet. But like when I was a kid, I remember like at some point there was just nothing on TV. Am I, am I alone on this? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out my crowd here. You guys remember that? Like there was just a point where it's like there's nothing on TV. Like there was a point where there's just nothing to do. Like I could only do the same hundred piece puzzle, you know. I can only beat my cousins and Jim Rummy so much. Like at some point there was just nothing. Now you can be distracted at all times. There's so much good content on TV. There's so much to stream. Like you can't even get to it all, right? It's so easy to be distracted. And I think that's some of our problem is that we don't have intimacy with God where we have regular communication and communion with him. And so here's the deal. We cannot wait until crisis comes to look for the secret place. And if I can just run with this a little bit more. You know, this is the, this is the kind of thing we need to understand in a year like this, in our election year. Because if you guys remember our last election year, 2020, I mean, we were doing, dealing with a lot. We, we had the divisiveness of bipartisanship, right? We had a controversial worldwide pandemic that we were dealing with. We also had a lot of racial issues that were flaring up because of the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, among many others. And, and if you guys remember, I don't know if you remember this like I do, but I just remember in that time that many of the Christian voices were either surprisingly quiet 
or overly obnoxious. And you know why? I can tell you why. It's because before you can have a prophetic voice, you first need to have a prophetic ear. Uh, I will. Before you can have a prophetic voice, you first have to have a prophetic ear. If you cannot hear God, shut your mouth. Right, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, keep this energy because as the elections heat up, I'm going to be in your face. Now, if I see you acting wild, play me if you want. Ask my kids. Daniel said, wait, 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 wait. Give me some time. He went, he got his boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they did a familiar thing. They prayed. They prayed. And so in their smaller furnace, they chose intimacy over despair. And so it's because of these smaller tests and smaller furnaces that we get to Daniel chapter 3, and we see them in this stare down with the king talking crazy. All right? It's because they had been there before. Right? Their identity as believers was so firm that they were willing to be publicly isolated and executed with no guarantee of deliverance. Right? When you approach stories like this, I think some of the reasons why we become numb to it is because we know how the story ends. Yeah. Like, imagine them stepping to the king saying, I don't care what you do. I'm not doing this. Seeing that fiery furnace right there. They had no idea what was going to happen. No idea. And so lastly, let's look at their victory. Starting in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And so these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. He asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God, to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, be cut into pieces and their houses, be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. All right, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, orders that they be burned. He heats up the furnace seven times hotter than it was. He has them bound and they're thrown in, and that should have been the end of the story. That should have been it, but then something happens. Uh, there's this uh, ancient translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek called the Septuagint. Um, and it's in this account of the story, I love, I love how it kind of gives this account. This is what it says. It says that Nebuchadnezzar's attention was caught when he heard the men singing praises to God while in the fire. The way his attention was caught, the way that he knew something was wrong, is he heard the men praising while they were in the fire. Now, it would have been astonishing for anything to survive a few seconds in this furnace, but miraculously, he didn't just see the three boys alive in there, but they were walking around 
they were unbound and they were unharmed. And he saw a fourth person in the fire. And it was, it was Nebuchadnezzar himself who says the fourth person looks like a son of the gods. Now, this is what scholars call a theophany or Christophany, which is a, a, a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus in the Old Testament. All right. Saw four people in the fire. And so they wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend. And because Jesus was in the fire with them, they wouldn't burn. They wouldn't burn. Now, it's important to clarify that these three boys were willing to die. Right? They were willing to die. They, they knew that God could rescue them, but didn't assume that he would. And had they died in this fire, this story would have still been inspirational. It would have been. Right? History is littered with so many people who were burned at the stakes for their faith. Right? It's happened to many. Right? I'm also reminded of uh, Cassie and Rachel um, in April of 1999. They're two girls at Columbine High School who were shot and killed. And I was a freshman in high school when this happened, and I wasn't walking with Jesus. And even I, at the time, I was moved when I found out that the reason why they were killed is because they would not renounce their faith. Right? And so it's still an inspiration, right? And so I say that to say this, is that I wish that I could say to you that you would never experience a furnace. I can't say that. But what I can say to you is that if you're walking with Jesus, if you believe, if you trust, and if you rely on Jesus, he will be in the fire with you. He will be in the fire with you. Psalm 34, 17 Right. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers from them all. Right. And so like these boys, if you're walking with Jesus, think about this. If you're walking with Jesus, when you enter into the fire, you have a God who delivers. He will deliver you from death or through death. But either way, you get delivered. You get delivered. Guys can come back and wrap up here. So as we wrap up, I just want to give you uh, just a few more things I want you to see in their experience here, uh, because when they were thrown in the fire, I want you to think about it with me. They were thrown in the fire. What did the fire burn? The ropes. The ropes. The only thing the fire burned was the ropes that bound them. The only thing that the fire burned was that which restricted and hindered them. It's the only thing it burned. So this is God's glorious work for a furnace that he may allow you to enter. Stop fearing your furnaces. Stop fearing them. Face them head on. Lean into the danger. See, when you suffer, you may think to yourself, God, why are you sending me here to burn? And God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm not sending you here to burn. I'm here to burn off your bonds. I'm burning off your bonds. Your furnaces allow you to see God, and they only make you better. They allow you to see God, and they only make you better. Right? The other thing about our furnaces is that they are a witness to the watching world. All right, I want us to think about Nebuchadnezzar for a second here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes from being a, a capital I idolater Right? He makes this statue, he makes everyone worship it. He says to the three boys, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Right? Basically saying, no God is stronger than I am. So he goes from that to calling them servants of the most high God. The most high God. And then he makes the greatest confession of this whole story when he says, no other God can save in this way. When he pulls them out of the furnace, he praises God. He retells their story to everyone. He brags about their bravery and open rebellion to his commands. He even threatens the lives of anyone who says anything about this God. Now, it was too far, but, you know, consider the source. Right? He completely changes the way he sees this God. Right? I think there's a lesson here for us, and it's this, that people are watching us. People are. People are watching us. You may have haters, critics in your life who want to see you fall. They're watching you. But you know who else is watching you? Are people who are just neutral 
right? That they have not called on the name of Jesus at all. And they're looking for a reason to believe. They're watching. They're watching us. And so when you and I do right, when it, even when it costs us, when we suffer well, even our enemies take notice and become better preachers than we are. I've seen this. Last part of their victory is what happens at the very end, because after all the drama, uh, they get promoted again. See, their haters tried to bring them down. They tried to tear them down, but they were only putting them in position to be elevated more in the kingdom order. That's all that happened. Right? The Bible says that sin recoils on itself. If you read the book of Psalms, you see it comes up a few times. Sin recoils on itself, which means sin recoils on itself, which means that if you dig a hole for someone else, you end up falling in it yourself. Right. Uh, C.S. Lewis has a great quote on this. He says it this way. He says, if you set yourself against God to defy his will, you will only end up accomplishing his will at your own expense. Haters are elevators, right? If you're walking with God and you're committed to the refining process that the fiery furnaces bring into your life, your L's are only lessons. They're only lessons, and God uses them to burn the things that are binding you. Amen. Let's stand together. Uh, we're going to respond and worship. Are you able to sing that holy song again? Oh, I was fire. I was fire. We're going to sing that again. All right. We're going to sing, uh, but before we do, I want to see that Jesus Christ is the ultimate cheat code for us as believers. All right. Worse than a shark attack, worse than being shot by a poisonous arrow called by a bear for you. So the, the, the reason why you can be unharmed in your furnace is because Jesus Christ was harmed for you. The reason why that you can walk around unbound and unharmed is because Jesus was hung and nailed on a cross for you. And if you remember that Jesus was thrown into the ultimate furnace for you, you will fill him in your cooler, smaller furnaces with you. Um, years ago, uh, Jonathan Edwards, he preached a sermon called Christ's Agony, talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was, uh, he was sweating drops of blood. We know that. And this is what Jonathan Edwards says about him. He says, in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, had then a near view of the furnace of God's divine wrath into which he was about to be cast. A furnace vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. Jesus was brought in the garden to a place where he stood and viewed its raging flames. He saw the glowings of its heat that he might know what he was about to suffer. This was the thing that filled his soul with sorrow and darkness. This terrible sight, as it were, overwhelmed him. He took that for you. Amen. So our prayer team is going to come forward. You know, the gospel tells us that we've all sinned, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and that we deserve to be cast away from God, that we deserve to lose God forever when we die. And because we are built for God's presence, to lose God forever means to be in agony. It's hell. It's actually a furnace. But Jesus Christ came to earth and on the cross experienced that wrath. Jesus was thrown into the ultimate furnace that we deserve and that's how we're saved. And so we do not have to fear our furnaces because Jesus already took it for us. I want you to notice something, which I didn't point out. I want you to notice that when the three Hebrew boys came out of the furnace, Jesus did not come out with them. Did you notice that in the story? 
when the three boys came out of the furnace, Jesus did not come out with them. Why do you think that is? I have a guess. You want to know my guess? Well, I have the microphone, so you have to hear it anyway. Here's my guess. My guess is Jesus didn't come out of their furnace because he knew that he would one day need to be there for you and yours. Uh, last thing, I, I went to a funeral yesterday and um, I really don't like funerals, which is really bad for someone in the profession that I'm in. I really don't like funerals. Uh, but it was honoring an incredible man of God, Roy Davis, an incredible man of God. And they were telling the story of his life. And basically here, this is a man who was serving two life sentences. He's a pastor. He was serving two life sentences. He got caught up in, in something and was in prison. I think he served almost 20 years in prison. And he had friends who would visit him regularly uh, in service. He, he basically reconnected with God while he was in prison. And he had friends who would visit him regularly that were working in the prison. And so he invites them to his chapel. And he says to them, before they go to the chapel, he says to them, hey, I just need to warn you. And I imagine they were thinking, oh, man, okay, the guys in here are, are pretty, like, rowdy, blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, 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 I need to warn you. We get happy back there. And I was just so moved by that because I'm like, these are guys who are serving life sentences. And he has to, to warn his friend, who is not a prisoner, that, hey, we go crazy back there. Right. Listen, we got to be like these boys who are in the fire singing praises to God, you guys. Later on, uh, when he got out of prison, he by, by miracle was allowed to go back and minister to guys in the prison. And when he went there, someone who recognized him said to him, hey, Roy Davis, he said, are you coming here to tell everyone that there's light at the end of the tunnel? And he said, no, 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 no. I'm coming here to tell them that there's light in the tunnel. It, it's interesting to note that at times prisoners can be more free than free people. And this is, listen, this is the devil's trick. The devil wants to bind you. And he wants to make you a captive. But God is here. And he will allow the fiery furnaces to come into your life. And so if you're here today, you would say, Sean, I have been in a fiery furnace. And it's been hot. But I'm recognizing now that I need to look for Jesus in that furnace and I'm ready to see him today. If that's you, if you say, Sean, I'm ready to see Jesus in the fire, just raise your hand so I can pray for you. I just wanna pray for you, see you, see you. 